from the backwoods of the frontier. He arrives on the national stage. Honest Abe, the simple plains lawyer. Frank, candid, and forthright. This is the Lincoln we know, but it's not the whole truth. Beneath this mythic surface lies a master politician, a skilled manipulator, and clever tactician, bending men to his will. Many had realized at some point that they were just chess pieces on Lincoln's board. Abraham Lincoln, American mastermind. Every American schoolchild knows his image. The frontier roots, towering height, and honest reputation are all legendary. But he's also a man of surprising cunning and calculation, one skilled at manipulating men and shaping his own image. Without these talents, he would never have been elected president. Winter, 1860. Lincoln is a prominent lawyer in the town of Springfield, Illinois. He holds no political office, yet audaciously seeks the biggest prize of all, the White House. Gaining his party's nomination won't be easy. Compared to his rivals, he's seen as a political featherweight. And Lincoln knows that image is everything. As the clerk of a troubled store, he earned the nickname Honest Abe by repaying his creditors instead of hiding from them. Now, he cleverly exploits this reputation by presenting himself as a simple man of integrity. Songs are even composed praising his honesty. Though the image was built on truth, it was by no means the whole truth. I guarantee you those who knew Lincoln best uh, never called him Honest Abe or Old Abe. So Lincoln was a very shrewd manufacturer of his public image. People knew Lincoln as a small town lawyer, but in his youth, he had occasionally split a fence rail or two. How do you package someone like that? Well, you package him by going back to his roots on the farm and asserting that Abe Lincoln is simply a good-hearted man, straight from the land, a rail splitter. Which was a much more politically potent image than Lincoln the railroad lawyer, which is in fact how he made his living. To drive home the point, his supporters drag fence rails into the convention hall. Even though Lincoln finds the image undignified, he plays along. The Republican Party prints thousands of rail splitter leaflets and distributes them throughout the country. Lincoln becomes a household name. Lincoln had an instinctive grasp of how to sell himself. And it was something that evolved and grew and became more sophisticated uh, as Lincoln himself did. Lincoln's powers of manipulation are evident early in his life. He first learns to influence people as a young man on the frontier. At age 22, he leaves his family's remote cabin for the town of New Salem, Illinois. Here, he faces a tough crowd. The Clary's Grove Boys in New Salem were the local ruffians. Uh, they were up to all kinds of mischief. They were the Hellraisers of the frontier. The bullies of New Salem see a chance to humiliate the newcomer. So they challenge Lincoln to a wrestling match. According to some witnesses, the gang's leader plays dirty. But Lincoln doesn't give up. His willingness to stand and fight has a profound impact on the Clary's Grove boys. Lincoln, far from further aggravating the opinion of this local gang, actually won their admiration. And it's the first great indication of the persuasive power that Lincoln had with people. 
By some accounts, he loses the match, but learns an important lesson. Turning one's rivals into allies has its rewards. They helped him win elections. They, they went out and voted for him at elections and promoted his candidacy in other villages and, and helped him to win his first election to the legislature. As a local politician and then circuit lawyer, Lincoln discovers how easily his words can influence others and begins crafting his political future. But he hides his ambition behind false modesty. Fellow citizens, I presume you all know who I am. I am humble Abraham Lincoln. If elected, I shall be thankful. If not, it will be all the same. But the humble lawyer is a skilled adversary in the courtroom. In one famous murder case, Lincoln discredits the key witness, arguing there wasn't enough moonlight to view the crime. One of his law colleagues once said, if you ever underestimated him, if you ever thought that he was simple or folksy, you would find you and your client in a ditch on your back. In 1837, at age 28, he first arrives in Springfield, Illinois, and casts his spell over voters and juries alike. But the younger Lincoln doesn't limit himself to the high-minded rhetoric that will make him famous. He excelled at slicing up his political opponents with sarcasm. The problem was he learned fairly early on that sarcasm makes you as many enemies as it does friends. Lincoln's sharp wit eventually gets him into trouble. He publicly ridicules a politician named James Shields, calling him a fool and a liar. In response, Shields challenges him to a duel. Lincoln will not be dubbed a coward, but he faces a real threat to his life. So he manipulates the situation by laying down the terms. For their weapons, Lincoln skips the customary pistols and instead chooses swords. The reason soon becomes clear. Before the duel began, Lincoln emphasized his long reach by taking his saber, his sword, reaching up and slicing off a branch from a willow tree above him and giving Shields an idea of how long his arms were and what he might do to him in the course of the duel. Lincoln also demands they place a board between them that neither can cross. This gives Lincoln, with his long limbs, a natural advantage. The two men soon reach a peaceful agreement, and the duel is called off. Though Lincoln is learning how to influence others, ironically, one of the few minds he has trouble controlling is his own. Mastering his emotions is not an easy task, for he struggles inwardly with depression. Ghosts from the past haunt him. The death of his mother to milk poisoning, his baby brother in infancy, his sister's death in childbirth, and the death of Anne Rutledge, his rumored sweetheart. These losses predisposed him to depression, and then later, when he suffered setbacks in his political career or other losses, it reminded him of these early losses and the pain that he felt then. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on the earth. In 1841, his best friend leaves Springfield. His engagement to Mary Todd falters, and Lincoln goes into deep depression. A friend worries he might even commit suicide and remove sharp objects from his reach. But Lincoln reassures him, saying he couldn't take his life, for he had not done anything worthy of being remembered. Lincoln used work as a cure for depression because it constantly got his mind off thinking about himself and what he felt like and onto something that existed objectively outside of himself. In 1858, Lincoln enters the Illinois Senate race. He knows he's a long shot, 
but never one to walk away from a fight. He challenges the incumbent, Stephen Douglas, to a series of debates. Citizens of the great state of Illinois. Now, you can almost hear Douglas thinking out loud. I'll show him who's really in charge. It was the greatest mistake Douglas ever made. Before proceeding, let me say that I think I have no prejudice against Southern people. I believe that they are just what we would have been had we been born in their circumstances. If slavery... Lincoln has set the ultimate political trap. He's made a much better known political personality elevate him to equal status by sharing a platform with him in seven cities. I leave you now hoping that the lamp of liberty may burn ever more brightly in your own heart. Thank you. Lincoln's courtroom skills give him an edge. But his performance isn't flawless. And during one debate, he exhibits strange, troubling behavior. I accuse Mr. Lincoln of not supporting our efforts. When Douglas attacks his voting record, Lincoln becomes enraged. He grabs a fellow lawmaker by the neck and demands he refute the charges. It is a downright lie and I won't have any more of it. He could explode in anger um, relatively frequently. Lincoln's friends notice other odd behavior, incoherent rambling and insomnia. The idea of Abraham Lincoln, a man of infinite patience, being quick-tempered and prone to bizarre episodes, intrigues historians to this day. Now, scientists may have discovered an explanation for these outbursts. It is a downright lie, and I won't have any more of it. You have heard many For years, Abraham Lincoln treated his depression with a medicine common in the late 19th century, known as Blue Mass, 